Hello and welcome back to The Road to 2000. As always, I'm Caleb Denby and I'm your driver on this journey. Uh, so today the topic I wanted to talk about is actually the Isolated Queen Pawn, the IQP for short positions. And uh, it's a pretty popular topic in chess and it comes up quite often. So are you guys familiar with the IQPs? Uh, <laughs> yeah, one yes, one no. So basically it's, it's just an isolated pawn that's in front of the queen, so it's the D pawn. So we're going to be looking at positions uh, from the side with the isolated pawn today and seeing what some common plans are and uh, trying to delve a little bit deeper into the specifics of it because you've probably heard some rules already about it, which I'll get into a little bit later on. But yeah, let's just take a look at this game. Um, so this was a game that Dave Navarro played against someone named Homerson, who I'm not too familiar with. And uh, poor Homerson was outrated by about 500 points. So it didn't go too well for him, but it was an, an instructive game to see uh, what kind of happens. Uh, so it started with knight f3, d5, and the IQP can actually arise from a wide variety of openings. This is just one of them, uh, c4. Uh, and here we saw d takes c4. So now we're kind of going to transpose into a queen's gambit accepted kind of position. So e3, knight f6, bishop c4. So you can kind of imagine how this would come from you know, a queen's gambit ex accepted uh, kind of position with e3 and bishop takes. Uh, it was just a different way of getting to it. Different move order, kind of transposed. We saw c5, so this is how we know we're going to kind of approach an IQP. Uh, queen e2. C takes d4. So I want to ask you what you guys might do here. Obviously, because the lecture is on isolated queen pawns, so you can guess what Dave Navarra did. But I want to see you know, what your first instinct would be. How do you want to take back on d4, with the knight or with the pawn? My first instinct is the knight. First instinct is the knight. And why is that? Because you don't get the isolated pawn that way. OK, sure, because you don't get the isolated pawn. Uh, and so you know, in chess, we're often taught that isolated pawns are a weakness, and you should avoid them. But uh, you know, the IQP can be a little bit different, because it, sure, it's isolated. It, it can become a target. But very often, it can also be a benefit to the position. So what are some benefits to taking on d4 with the pawn? To taking like this. It opens up lines, e, e file. So yeah, it opens up uh, the e file. Sure, that's one important thing. It creates an imbalance too, which is nice in chess. Pawn yeah, uh, just by virtue of uh, changing the structure, it creates an imbalance. So you know, there's going to be something black can play for and something white can play for. Uh, more specifically. Uh, the D pawn, just on its own, does quite a lot. It controls E5 and it controls C5. And these can both be pretty important squares. And we're going to see this E5 square come into play a little bit later on. It is actually a really important square. It's kind of crucial to all of White's plans in IQP positions. But maybe even most of all, most important of all, uh, it opens up this bishop. So now this bishop has squares it can go to. It uh, can kind of contribute in any sort of attack. And we're not going to have to worry about uh, being able to develop this guy. Whereas if we were, were to play knight takes, the main, I think, downside is this bishop's going to be stuck for a while. And sure, we can play b3 and bishop b2, but uh, that's going to take a little bit longer, and it's really not going to be uh, much of an advantage for white, or much of a try for an advantage. So I want to mention a quote. Uh, you might have heard the quote before. It's by uh, Tarash. He said that he who fears the isolated queen pawn uh, should give up chess. So you guys got to start taking on d4. Otherwise, Tarash is going to be mad at you. Uh, so e takes d4 is what was played in the game. And it's what's kind of recommended to try and keep the game going. Uh, we saw bishop e7, castles, uh, castles. And now uh, let's take a, a breath here and try and think about what we want to do with our pieces. So let's look at the white side. We're trying to play from the white side. Where do we want to put our pieces? Let's just go one by one. Where does this knight want to go? C3. Yeah, c3. That's pretty simple, right? And then from there, it can look to maybe hop in later to e4 to control d5. It has options on c3. On c3, we can call it develops. Uh, what about this bishop? Do we know where we want to put it yet? Sure, f4 looks fine. It eyes a lot of squares on the queen side. Uh, but you know, like you said, you're not so sure yet. And sometimes that's the right answer. So we're not s entirely sure what the best place for this bishop is. So I would leave it alone for a little bit. 
And then even more importantly than that, where does this rook want to go? What do we think? Yeah, to the E file would be kind of uh, interesting. And it does go there in quite a lot of lines. There's actually a better square for it, which is the only other square. And yeah, that's on D1, actually. And the point might be a little bit hidden right now. But uh, there is a very specific point uh, to putting the rook on D D1. And it looks like a strange idea a little bit later on in the game. And we'll try to find it. But it comes up a, a lot more often than you might expect. Uh, so knight C3, uh, knight B to D7. So there are a couple ways black can actually play with knight b to d7 or knight c6, and both are actually probably OK here. Uh, and I'll talk about the difference a little bit. Rook to d1. And so uh, we know what we want to do, right? We put our rook here, we put our bishop here, uh, and we got our knight out. And so let's talk about plans for a moment. You might have heard uh, you know, a few principles about IQP positions, right? So those principles you've heard might be, what does black want to do? more than anything. Let's think about you know, what our opponent's trying to do here. They're, yeah, so uh, not specifically moves. I mean uh, principles. So you might have heard, OK, if you're playing against the IQP, you want to do this, and you want to do this. There are two big things that you might have heard. Well, I imagine you might have put a knight in front of it. Yeah, that's the first big thing is you want to blockade the pawn. You want to put a piece on the d5 square to blockade the pawn, whether it be a knight, which it usually is, or, or anything else. So that's uh, big thing number one. And then what's uh, important principle number two for black? Well, looking at that, I would want to say complete development. Well, OK, completing development. But that can be said about pretty much any chess position is you want to complete development. Okay. Um, what I'm looking for is, yes, yeah, someone in the YouTube chat has said it. Uh, you want to exchange minor pieces. You want to take off some pieces. Now, why would that be? Why would black want to trade pieces? White's pieces are more active right now. So yeah, the first thing is white's pieces are more active. Uh, the second thing is that they're more active because this pawn gives white a space advantage. So when, you're, when you have less space, you generally want to trade pieces. And the third thing has to do with what white's plan is. So you might have heard that with, uh, you know, with the IQP, you need to play actively, right? You need to play actively and try to find some sort of active advantage. But uh, you might not have heard that the way that usually manifests, the way that usually comes to life in the, these positions, is through an attack on the king. So uh, to defend his king, black often wants to trade off some of those minor pieces so he doesn't get checkmated. Uh, and then black or white? So black wants to trade off pieces yeah, yeah. so that white doesn't checkmate him, right. if I can be uh, as specific as possible. And uh, so yeah, let's see uh, how that manifests here. So we saw knight b6. And the reason for that is it's twofold. One, it threatens to trade pieces, which you know white doesn't want to allow. And two, he's preparing to put his knight on d5, where he, you know, it's kind of the dream square. So white simply brings the bishop back to b3. And I want to ask you about that move. So you, given the choice between b3 or d3, what choice would you make and why? And sometimes the bishop does go to d3, so don't feel like you know one of these is totally wrong. Uh, I wondered that myself. <laughs> well, d3 is blocking the rook. So that's one thing. On d3, you're blocking the rook, but that's not the main reason why uh, bishop b3 was played. Bishop on b3 is going to go to c2 eventually, I'm guessing. Sure. So yeah, on b3, you are still keeping your options open to come back to c2. But I mean, you could do that through the d3 square as well, if you really needed to. There's a pretty important difference. And it has to do with uh, where we're going to end up putting our other pieces later on. Well, OK. If the knight is going to go to e5, then the bishop on e3 is going to block the protecting rook. So yeah, that's one thing that was mentioned, is on d3, the bishop does block the rook. This usually doesn't actually become too important, though, because I mean, let's just say, for example, OK, I don't know, rook e8 and knight e5. This pawn still isn't touchable yet because of bishop h7. So this isn't the most important reason. But let's take another look at what you uh, just mentioned. So on e5, the knight does something pretty nice. It does a lot of nice things. But one nice thing is it pressures f7. 
And so this is actually the reason why we want to put the bishop on b3 instead of d3 in this case. is because you'll end up seeing a, a crazy amount of tactics, actually, that involve this bishop becoming very useful in pressuring these two pawns. Uh, let's say, I don't know, bishop d7. Uh, let's, I don't know, find some move for white. Uh, let's say bishop g5, for example. So very often, uh, black will want to play something like bishop to c6 to get it active. And here already, you know, white can kind of win the game. So what's the winning tactic here? Well, here it's knight f7. Yeah, that's right. Knight f7. And, you know, of course, this would be a little... A little bit too much. I don't think the king can get away with running to g6, though I haven't calculated it. But uh, so yeah, knight to f7. And so obviously you're not expecting your opponent to blunder this, but it is kind of taking away an extra option of bringing this bishop to c6, which can be quite important. That's why I wouldn't move that bishop. I would move the rook over to c8. Yeah, so I mean, rook c8 is a fine move, but then, you know, white's simply going to continue with the plan, and this bishop isn't going to be happy. You know, the bishop would really love to kind of get out of. Uh, get onto this long diagonal here, but it wouldn't be able to in this specific case. So for that reason, which is mainly just to pressure these pawns, and whether it be for that reason specifically, or maybe other tactics appearing later on, uh, the bishop goes to b3 a lot of the time. Uh, so we did see bishop to d7. Uh, we saw this knight e5 move. And so this is really where the white knight belongs in this opening, is this e5 square. That's where it can kind of do the most. Uh, bishop c6. So now I want to ask you, would you capture this bishop? Uh, obviously, in this case, we don't have the same uh, tactic, because this rook's still on f8, uh, protecting f7. So we could play knight takes c6 here, though. What do you think about that move? Upsides or downsides? I think that plays into black's hands. Plays into black's hands. How is that? Well, it gets rid of, you exchange a really good knight for an upside bishop. Yeah, that's an excellent point. One of the most things, one of the biggest things Black wants to do is trade off some pieces, and so that would trade one set of pieces. You know, on the upside though, you might say, well, hey, it's a fairly open position, and I have I have two bishops uh, compared to you know my opponent's one, so maybe my, bish my bishops can do some work here. But uh, in addition to trading pieces, uh, one other upside you might say that, well, hey. I have an isolated queen's pawn, but now my opponent has two isolated pawns, right? So you might say, well, he's got double the weaknesses I do. I have the bishop pair. This should be great for me. But uh, what's wrong with that thinking? What's wrong? Your first instinct is kind of right to be a little wary of uh, taking on c6. Well, sure, it's white's turn, but uh, black well, no, I'm not saying black has a specific threat. Oh. I'm saying white probably shouldn't go in for this, uh, just on for positional reasons. It's not going to be uh, great for him. Then knight on c3 is blocked. From the sure. So, uh, kind of expanding on what you said, you said the knight on c3 is kind of blocked from moving, moving up now. And uh, the reason for that is this pawn on c6, it's isolated, but it's actually a very, very good pawn. And the first, so the first reason it was bad is it traded off a piece in an IQP position. The second reason is it actually helps black blockade the pawn even further. It adds another defender to d5. And then the flaw with thinking, OK, well, black has two isolated pawns, two weaknesses, is it's really going to be pretty tough to attack these guys. C6 might be able to be attacked with the rook on C1 someday, but A7 really isn't going to be too big of a weakness. In fact, black might later push this pawn down the board and kind of break up white's pawns like that. So while knight takes C6 is playable, it is actually kind of fine for white because you know there are these certain advantages. It's not really in the theme of an IQP position. It's kind of really changing the structure, changing the plans. So in this game, uh, white decided not to take on C6, I think wisely. And he played a, a pretty interesting move, I think. So here I want to stop and try to come up with a, a winning plan for white. Given, given a few moves, what do we want to try to do? And this has to do with why we brought this rook to d1 rather than e1. 
So the hidden point's going to be revealed here. So let's give away, you know, maybe a couple free moves and see what we want to do, where we want to put well, well, our pieces. Well, the moves I'm looking at are either d5 right away or knight times f7 and just get that king out even if you're losing a knight for two pawns. Sure. So yeah, you're looking at some pretty crazy stuff. You want to break it open right away, whether it be through d5, which is a, a pawn sack, or knight takes f7, which unfortunately I don't think either of these can work right away. Uh, we'll see rook takes, and then I don't know how you want to take back on e6. Uh, whether it be with the bishop or the queen, I think bishop e8, and maybe black can kind of hold on here. Um, and with d5, I, I don't think this works quite, a, quite enough as well. Black, thankfully, has enough defenders that he shouldn't be in much danger here. Well, I'm looking at those as the two. I'm looking at those as potential. Yeah, and those, that's a great way to, to think about it, because these are pretty much two critical moves. Where if black has played incorrectly, these are going to be the moves that kind of win immediately for white. So you're doing well to, to think about those. But they don't quite work here. So yeah, it, you're doing well. Uh, again, you want to develop this bishop. But uh, once again, it's really not clear what the best square is. With bishop g5, maybe black is uh, playing this move. And again, he wants to trade off pieces at all if possible. And on f4, it's a similar problem, where he might just run into getting attacked right away. So I mentioned earlier that white's plan you know, is supposed to play with activity. And what does that mean? Well, usually it means an attack on the king's side. So we want to start generating an attack on the king's side somehow. How can we start shifting pieces over to that side of the board? One is bishop c2. Mm -hmm. So yeah, bishop c2 would be a fine move, I think. But uh, all right. Well, <laughs> yeah, no, this idea is. Uh, I can't blame you guys for not finding this idea, because it kind of shocked me at first, too. I actually wasn't so familiar with these positions until I started doing a little work for tonight's class. The idea was rook to d3. And so rook to d3, at first, it looks a little strange. But the idea, of course, he just wants to bring this rook over to the king's side and give checkmate. Uh, and so this is a very common idea in IQP positions, actually. It's just bringing this rook over to the king's side and just trying to deliver checkmate using it. And it's quite powerful, too. It's kind of difficult to stop. Uh, so in the game, we saw knight uh, b to d5, and simply rook to g3. And now all of a sudden, they're very, very, very concrete threats that look uh, very dangerous for black. It kind of came out of nowhere, but this rook, once it appears on g3, is, is quite a dangerous piece. So in the game, black felt the need to play knight takes c3, b takes c3, and bishop e4. So this was very, very committal for black, right? What has black done here? Well. So the point of black's play was he wants to bring this bishop back to g6, where he can defend his king. But what has he given up on? He's given up something pretty important. What's the title of the lecture? <laughs> it's isolated queen pawns, right? Yeah, you give that up. This pawn's not isolated any anymore. So black has forfeited his main weakness in the position. So his main thing that he got counterplay from was attacking this d pawn. And now he's not really going to have that quite so easily anymore. And so it takes a lot for black to have to give up on uh, this pawn. So what do you think's wrong with something like king to h8? Well, actually. White's activity is already so great. Uh, while it, it looks like black is fully developed, but none of his pieces can really defend this king uh, quite well enough. And so white's attack is simply going to be breaking through here. Uh, actually, rook h3 would be perhaps the next move, just keeping this rook opposite this king and aiming at some more weaknesses. Then play might continue something like you know rook to c8, a very simple move, getting developed. But after bishop g5, now finally this bishop comes into action. And now, you know, 
And the difference here is it's not so easy to get this piece to trade off, right? And it's I'm pretty much the only defender of black's king, this knight on f6. And uh, so black would have to try to do something about this, maybe h6, uh, trying to give the knight this h7 square. But already it's, it's far too late. After something like bishop c2, knight g8, and queen e4, threatening a checkmate, uh, knight back to f6, uh, simply queen to f4, and black is just totally busted here. Uh, white's just going to take on h6 next turn and pretty much win the game. So things can go wrong very, very fast, and black kind of sensed the danger. Uh, so it might be some, something that would happen after king to h8. Something like rook to e8 would also be playable, but once again, uh, things are going to go downhill fast after bishop h6 and g6. Uh, black has made quite a lot of weaknesses now. Uh, this rook no longer defends this pawn on f7, so again, you're going to have these tactics of knight takes f7 popping up. And uh, after g6, the, light square, the dark squares are also weak, and you know this is also going to be an idea from white. So black didn't like the look of these things, which is why black ended up uh, giving up on the IQP and taking and going into what's called a hanging pawn structure. And now I think this is actually going to be quite good for white. Uh, so we see bishop e4. Again, the idea is to bring this bishop back to help defend. And white already uh, continues breaking through with the move c4. After bishop f5, we saw bishop b2, simply defending this pawn. Uh, knight up to e4, hitting that rook, simply rook e3. Saw knight d6. And uh, it's pretty clear to see who's doing better here. Uh, white's knight is much more active. Uh, again, it, it can stay on e5, thanks to this d-pawn, whereas black's knight has had to move because of the absence of this uh, central pawn. And uh, white in the game simply continued breaking through in the center after c5 uh, and g4 already, actually, really highlighting uh, how black's pieces have simply run out of squares. And after d5, it's, it's pretty much over. Uh, bishop takes c5, takes, and the tactics uh, work out. You can't bring the king to the h file, because this would be checkmate, so you have to give the exchange back. Uh, my arrow key stopped working. Strange. OK, so rook f7 takes, and uh, this is actually checkmate. Well, close to it. You'll have to play knight d6. And uh, black's just totally busted here. His king kind of got ripped open. And so again, that all happened very, very fast. But uh, it's all because you know black had to give up kind of on this uh, center to defend on the king side. And then white really managed to break through almost immediately. Uh, yeah, so here, mm -hmm. uh, let's see, there's, uh, it's one of those positions where there just has to be a tactic. Uh, I'm not sure if it's uh, bishop b2. That looks pretty, uh, pretty good off the top of my head. I don't know where you want to go with this queen, maybe just to c5. And, okay, I mean, there's, there's stuff like knight d7 here, which is already kind of crazy. But you know, obviously, you can't really take because of because uh, of this kind of stuff, and it's, it's looking pretty nasty. It's looking pretty nasty. And okay, I mean, this queen can go somewhere else, but there's still gonna be still gonna be some some pretty crazy ideas here. So yeah, I mean, you got to be pretty brave to take this pawn, and I'm I'm sure the tactics work out for White, even if I'm not seeing all of them perfectly here. Oh uh, yeah, any any questions about this game though, because. Uh, I think this is the main idea I want to stick with you, is first of all, putting this knight on e5, that's just where the piece belongs. Uh, secondly, this idea of keeping this bishop to pressure on, uh, on this diagonal. And then thirdly, is bringing this rook over. This is a very, very important idea in the IQP positions. Okay, any questions about any of that? Yeah, well, fair enough. So if you're ever a 2200 playing against a 2700, maybe uh, avoid the IQP, because you're going to get checkmated. <laughs> That's the last moral of the story. Uh, let's take a look at maybe a little bit more of a fair fight. We had uh, Sam Shankland playing against uh, Valentin uh, Dragnev. Dragnev, I don't know. Uh, and let's see uh, how we got there in this case. We saw d4, knight f6, c4. And it's actually Queen's Gambit declined. And this is a pretty interesting pawn structure here. So have you guys seen something like this happen in your games ever? Yes, one, one yes, one no. So 
the thing about this pawn structure is that it's almost guaranteed to end up in an IQP position, uh, just because there's so much tension in the center. Uh, so many players are going to have to be recapturing that. There's probably going to be an IQP. Black held the tension for another move. And I do want to mention this is the Tarash defense. And Tarash is the man who said, he who fears the IQP should give up chess. So you know he likely had quite a lot of experience uh, himself with it, having this opening named after him. Uh, so white finally breaks the tension uh, with pawn takes d5. And we saw knight takes d5. Of course, white doesn't really want to take here and allow black to develop his bishop for free. So he leaves the tension there after bishop d3, bishop e7, castles, castles. And uh, white goes ahead and plays this queen e2 move. So this move that we've seen before. And this is really just a nice square for the queen in this opening. Uh, the queen can go to c2 sometimes, but uh, e2 is really where it feels the most at home, with opportunities to come up to e4, opportunities to come out on this diagonal, uh, different ways to kind of help in the attack. And actually on c2 in this case, of course, it would run into some specific problems. So we see queen e2, pawn takes, uh, e takes. A knight back to f6 in this case, actually. So one difference from the last game is black opted to put this knight on c6, rather d7. So he's putting a little extra pressure on this d-pawn, is pretty much all he's doing here. We see rook to d1. And uh, I, now I want to mention another very common maneuver that shows up in uh, IQP positions. So if black were to play something like rook to e8, there's a very important move that white can play here. It doesn't win material. It's not a tactical move. But it's a positional idea that really would improve white's position here. Let's see if you guys can, can find it. So yeah, you're thinking knight to e4. Um, the problem is this doesn't make an immediate threat, really. Uh, and the move that I'm thinking about doesn't make a threat threat either. But uh, yeah, I don't know. Knight e4, really, you're, you're just kind of asking to, to trade pieces, right? And maybe with the idea of removing an removing important the, defender. Yeah, but uh, yeah, knight e4 is interesting and does show up a lot. It's not really what I'm thinking about here, though. Yeah, knight g5 is playable. Uh, again, uh, you guys are trying to make very, very threatening moves. It's not the move I'm thinking of. I'm thinking of a very simple, just positional uh, kind of kind of a preventative move. It prevents black from doing something that black would really like to do. Bishop g5? No, b5. b5 hitting the knight. So you are currently preventing the move that I was worried about preventing. One problem might be is you're kind of asking once again just to trade off some pieces, right? You're giving black these opportunities to trade pieces. So it might help if you see what black played in the actual game. So once again, one of black's most important ideas, one is trading pieces, and two is blockading this pawn. So in the game, he played knight b4, rerouting this knight to d5. Uh, and the reason he did it immediately is because if black were to waste some time, play some random move like this, now white would play this move. A3. Yeah, simply a3. And this would be a very, very strong move for white. So in your games, if you ever do have the opportunity to play a3, it's a very strong idea against this knight on c6. So this knight on c6, really the, the best path for it is to go from b4 and into d5. And if it can't do that, then black is actually going to be in quite a bit of trouble. Um, in some other games you might see, uh, there's one other way for this knight to kind of get involved. And that's with the bishop coming to f6 and the other knight coming to e7. But uh, this maneuver has a lot of problems. Uh, a lot of problems with it. One of which being the move you guys were suggesting. Maybe not immediately, because it might hang this pawn. But there's these knight e4 ideas, which will always be hitting this bishop. And that can end up being quite annoying. And also, you know, queen e4 ideas as well. Uh, now that there's no knight on f6, can also put black's king in some danger. So, you know, black really needs to be playing knight b4 as soon as possible. Uh, or, you know, at least making sure he can do it before white can get in a3. So yeah, I did want to mention that with this knight before idea. Uh, of course, white couldn't play a3 on this turn because this pawn would be, would be hanging. So that's why we saw rook d1, knight b4 right away, and simply bishop c4, keeping that bishop. And uh, once again, 
adding some pressure on this uh, long diagonal here. We saw b6. So once again, black is finding a way to develop. In this case, he gets the long diagonal through b7 rather than through d7 and c6. Uh, simply knight e5. Again, this is really where that knight belongs. We see bishop b7. And uh, simply a3, forcing this knight to uh, stop attacking quite so many light squares here and forcing it back onto this blockading position. And now we see, once again, rook d3. So I wasn't lying to you guys. This, I this idea of bringing this rook up and over, it's very, very common, and it's very, very important and very useful for white. This is what's, uh, what wins a lot of games for white, is this rook lift coming up and over and then somehow, some way, breaking through on the king's side. Uh, in this case, though, black did manage to put up a little bit more resistance. So let's uh, follow along here. Played rook c8. Uh, again, hitting this bishop. White simply plays rook to h3 this time. He chose h3 instead of g3. Uh, honestly, I think rook g3 would have been fine as well. Uh, but in this case, white decided he would rather uh, kind of go after h7 rather than g7. We saw knight take c3. So once again, we see the same idea of black feeling the need to get this bishop into the defense. And this is a, an important idea to remember for black too, is when you're really uh, kind of under the gun like this and you need that extra defender, this is a great way to try to get it back in the game. As long as you realize, you know, you're compromising your structure. Well, you're fixing white structure, not compromising your own. And so this is kind of a, a last resort move for black. You don't really want to give white these hanging pawns uh, if you can help it. Uh, unless, you know, there's specifics in the positions, like you can blockade on c4, then it's probably good for you. But in general, it's better to play against the IQP without giving white uh, these hanging pawns, the hanging pawn structure. Uh, in the game, black did play bishop e4, the same defensive idea. And now actually is where white came up with this g4 idea. I think someone in the YouTube chat uh, mentioned this one in some kind of innocuous looking position. And in this case, it, it would be right. So what is white saying with, with g4? What is white trying to do? Get rid of the knight. Yeah, first of all, there's a pretty immediate threat of playing g5 and taking this bishop. So that's threat number one. Uh, what happens if black simply just moves this bishop away? Yeah, so I, I really think knight takes a bishop here would be, would be quite strong. And you would have to take back with the h pawn. And I'm not sure if there's uh, immediate tactics. It feels like there might even just be some serious sacrifices happening already. But uh, likely, you know, white's just going to warm his way over into uh, black's camp somehow. Also, something like g5 might come, followed by queen g4 and, you know, queen h4 when the time is right. And uh, yeah, th this would be pretty pretty bad for black, actually. So we didn't see bishop g6, actually. We saw h6. So black, again, felt compelled to move one of those, those king side pawns, which in general, you might have heard this rule, you don't really want to touch your pawns on the side where you're getting attacked. So again, black is making more weaknesses, more uh, compromises in order to kind of save his pieces in the immediate moment. Uh, continuing on, uh, how do we think white continued here? Let's see. What do we think uh, white can do? Let's come up with some, some candidate moves to keep this attack going. Well, what I'm thinking about is the bishop taking the, the uh, h6 pawn, but I'm not sure that's time yet. Yeah, bishop takes h6. So you said it might not be time yet. And uh, I think you might be right here. Although it is definitely one of the most important ideas in the position, is this sacrifice on h6. So once again, we see we never really found a great square for this bishop. But even on c1, it really contributes to the attack just by adding in these, these extra threats. So bishop takes h6 is an interesting idea, definitely. That's not the move that white made. I don't believe it is. I'm struggling to remember here. So I might be giving you guys kind of a trick question. Um, 
So yeah, so yeah G5, all, another interesting move. Uh, let's see. I wasn't really sure how black was intending to respond to this, because it does look quite dangerous. Yeah, so takes, bishop takes, maybe bishop f5 here. And then where do you want to go with the rook? Then maybe knight, uh, let's see. I think I can get away with knight e4. Maybe I can't. My screen is flashing black. That's terrifying. Uh, OK, knight d5 maybe. Yeah, you're right on that. So probably knight h7 is forced. Well, queen h5, I can. Yeah. So you'd probably have to take here first. And now, if queen h5, I think I could play queen g5, was going to be my idea. What did you just do here? So I played knight h7. So if you play queen h5, I can just take the bishop. So I was thinking you might take here first. And then if queen h5, I would have queen g5. Uh, thankfully, check and hitting the queen. And so black could maybe start trading off some pieces. And so uh, the point of this story is, yes, these are important ideas. These are what you want to be calculating, g5 and bishop takes h6. But uh, this is one of the hardest things in chess, is when you're attacking, sometimes you just need to be patient, right? Uh, and white simply played bishop d2 here. He said, my attack's not going anywhere. Uh, you're going to have a tough time bringing in any more pieces to help defend. And I'm simply going to play bishop d2. I'm maybe going to bring in this other rook to help the attack. And I'm just going to put my pieces on the best squares uh, possible. And then and only then will I break through with the sacrifice on h6, or this pawn push to g5. Uh, so we saw bishop h7 be played. And now actually, white again just calmly plays bishop to d3. Says, this bishop wasn't really pulling its weight on c4. I'd much rather trade it off for this defender on h7. So that's what he did. So bishop d3. Queen to d5. Black's aiming uh, maybe to bring in this queen to help defend. And now, actually, we saw, let's see, what did we see? Yeah, rook to e1. So once again, white's very patient. Just brings in the pieces. Uh, absolutely no rush at all. He's controlling e4 in this case, preventing black from putting a piece there. We saw bishop takes, queen takes, knight h7. And now the time is right. So. Uh, Black finally caved in. He said, wow, OK, if I do nothing, uh, then g5 is simply going to win, right? Because now in this case, it's even stronger because we're threatening mate on h7. Now that we've gotten rid of that bishop, this is simply just crushing. So uh, Black felt the need to play knight h7, the idea of controlling this g5 square. So what do you want to do with white now? Now's your time, guys. Yeah, let's go. Let's go. Bishop takes h6. And this is simply winning. Uh, finally, it's simply winning. And, uh, but the important thing to remember, uh, we saw all those same ideas from the first game. Uh, the, game the, most the main idea I wanted to share in this game is the patience that White had. White really didn't rush anything. He waited until you know, he was certain that bishop takes h6 was winning. He got all of his pieces involved. Uh, he kept this knight on the strong square. And he you know, first traded off black's key defender, the bishop on the light squares. And then, and only then, uh, did Sam Shankland break through with bishop takes h6. And now this is, this is simply dead. Uh, black did recapture. We saw rook takes uh, back on h6. And black felt the need to play f5 to uh, try and save himself. Um, there's really no better way to try to save this knight. If you come to g5, uh, maybe there's just pawn h4, actually. 
uh, kicking this knight and you know mate's kind of unstoppable. What about this square? Uh, once again, I think something like just g5, hitting the knight, is really going to be game over. So black felt the need to go in for f5, and it should be pretty clear that this sh shouldn't be holding. Uh, simply queen h3, hitting this knight once again. Uh, black tried to sacrifice on c3. White simply ignores the rook and plays queen h5. And here is when black threw in the towel and resigned. So. Another stunning win for the IQP. Do you guys want to play with it yet? Are you ready to, you know, get that IQP and not be afraid? Because uh, let me. It looks pretty good for white if things go wrong. It does look pretty good. So, any questions about about that game? About how we got to this point? Yeah, fair enough. Uh, once again, I want to say. Sure. So I think in this case, which, like I said, I do think rook g3 would be a fine move. I think this would be fine for white. I think my, white might actually still have an advantage after rook g3. Uh, I just think in this case, maybe white thought black would play g6 and could uh, hold on a bit better in this position th than the last one. Uh, probably bishop h6 would still come, and this would be you know quite dangerous still for black. But you know, black might drop this bishop back. And I think white just decided he'd rather go in for this rook h3, where he didn't see a, a very clear defense, rather than this forcing this kind of weakness for, for the long term. Uh, I do think both moves would be good, though. I do think both moves would be good. Um, other than that, again, main thing to remember, uh, with the defending side, with the black side here, this knight before to d5 maneuver is the most important maneuver, I think, uh, when you put this knight on c6. And so if white ever has the opportunity, white should be playing a3. Uh, in this game, black didn't give white the chance because black was a very strong player. But uh, that's an important maneuver to remember. And then the second thing I want to stress is the patience of this attack, right? You know, white launches the attack with g4, but after h6, white doesn't panic, doesn't try to play g5 right away. When he saw that the lines weren't working out for him, he simply plays bishop to d2, trades off that defender, and gets his last rook in the game. And then and only then is it enough for white to really break through and win. Uh, OK, with that in mind, we've got some time left. Let's take a look at the third game I want to go over. So this is maybe the highest rated game of the night. That's between Gelfand and Korchnoi, so two giants in, in the chess world. Uh, and yeah, let's just take a look at, at how we got there. So we saw d4, d5, c4 takes another kind of QGA type position. Uh, c5, castles, knight c6, queen e2. Once again, this uh, e2 square becoming a very common place for the queen to go. We saw c takes d4, rook d1. And white, once again, captures back with this pawn. And it's especially clear here. Uh, knight takes is really almost never, never correct for white. Uh, you know, here, white's giving up very little. In fact, he's even opening the file with the rook opposite the queen. But Gelfand still chooses to go for this IQP. It's really not something to be afraid of. It's almost, uh, it's almost an advantage for white, I would say, getting these, these IQP type positions. Uh, we saw castles, uh, a3. So like I said, in this case, uh, black castled, uh, getting his king out of the center. And white said, no, I'm, I'm not going to actually let your knight come to b4. I'm going to play a3 while I still have the chance. And so we'll see now maybe this other maneuver that uh, black can try to get this knight to blockade. So we see knight d5 and knight c3 in response. Black plays rook e8. White simply drops this bishop back to uh, a2. Maybe he was worried about some knight a5 stuff. Uh, and just simply tucking this bishop away is, is totally fine for white. And now uh, black did something uh, pretty interesting and, and pretty committal. So yes, it's possible that uh, black could play normally still with something like bishop to f6. I think would be pretty normal, uh, putting pressure on this pawn. But once again, something like knight e5 might come. And uh, already, I think black should, should probably take here. because. 
something like knight to e7 really isn't going to cut it after something like knight to e4. And you know, these are the type of moves that I said you really have to be worried about when this knight on c6 doesn't find its home on d5. Is something like knight e4 coming? And really, you know, pressure on the king side kind of really amps up quickly when you can't get that knight uh, where it belongs. And so looking at stuff like this, uh, Korchnoi actually decided to go in for an interesting line here. So Korchnoi took on a3, which actually does not hang a bishop, despite what you may think. Um, so of course, what is, what is the point? What happens if we, we take here? Yeah, knight c3, hitting e2 and d1. A little bit trickier, uh, what happens after bishop takes d5, threatening rook a3? Hello, Nervon Raymond. Good to see you in the chat. Bishop claps b2. Uh, no, not bishop takes b2. White would simply recapture and be up a piece. So yeah, b4 is available, but uh, you know it's it's a little more urgent than than you know, the positional stuff here because you know White's trying to win a piece. He takes this knight on a d5 maybe with the bishop, and so if Black just recaptures, we want to play rook a3. But actually, this was the point of rook e8 from uh, from Korchnoi, uh, is he can actually recapture here, winning a tempo on the queen, so we don't quite have time to to take this bishop. So because of that, the tactics actually work out for black. And we saw knight takes d5. Uh, once again, black has to take with the pawn, uh, putting pressure on this queen. So now we saw queen b5. And after, I'm sorry, bishop d6, uh, the point of white's play is also revealed. He lost this pawn on a3, but he's getting it back on d5. And so this was kind of a, a crazy way to get into what's still an IQP. And so the plans are obviously going to be a little bit different here, because it's a wildly different position than the last ones we looked at. Um, this but is the position now? Yeah, this is the position now. So just to quickly recap how we got there, uh, Black probably didn't really like his position after a3 happened, so he found this interesting way to change, change the structure. He took on a3, allowing uh, the specific line where it's still an IQP, but it's a different type of IQP. You know, e6 and a3 have kind of been traded for each other in this strange uh, tactical line. So, uh, what do we think's going on here? What do we think's going on here? Would you rather be black or white? I'd rather be white. Rather be white. Why is that? Spatial advantage. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there's a few things. Uh, like you said, there's a space advantage. And like you said, white has a lot of threats uh, going on uh, right away. So uh, because you know his pieces are more active. So black really has to try and consolidate if he wants to, to be OK here. So let me put up a, a random position, though. Uh, let's say something like, um, I don't know, something like h6 happens. White cashes in and takes this pawn. We see bishop e6, maybe even a, a different square. But let's say e6. And I, I don't know, maybe d5 and bishop g4 or something. And you get a position like this. Who would you rather be now? Would you rather still be white? Or maybe things are, are turning around. Sure, so all of a sudden it looks like black might have some more activity. But you know, white does have, have a central pawn for it. So I'm really not sure who's better here. But uh, the point being, if black can get his pieces out, if black can consolidate kind of without giving up too much, uh, white's certainly not just going to be kind of crushing this game, right? You know, there's, there's, there's certainly a lot of problems going on, especially with this knight. So uh, because of that, we actually did see h6. Uh, what do you think would happen if we just developed this uh, bishop here right away? OK, well, first of all, actually, I just hung b7. But let's say I make a better move. <laughs> um, 
I don't know, queen c7. White actually has a, a pretty annoying move here. Yeah, so this is idea that black. This is the idea that black was worried about in the game. Is knight g5 really puts some uncomfortable pressure on the seven, f7 square? So that's why black committed this extra turn uh, with h6 just to stop knight g5. Of course, though, you know white has another square available, and that's e5. So white went ahead and jumped onto e5 rather than trying to go in for this, you know, captures on the c6 line. So yeah, knight e5 putting pressure on uh, f7. And once again, black felt compelled to make a capture. So we saw bishop takes on e5 and pawn takes on e5. And now uh, the tactics actually work out that black can't quite recapture this pawn, thanks to some bishop f7 stuff. Not right away. I think you have to maybe kick around this rook first before bishop f7. But uh, the point is, OK, black can't take back on, on e5 just yet. And so once again, white has used his activity to force black to kind of capture something and change the structure. So what do we think about this change of structure? You know, this pawn moving from d4 to e5, who does it benefit? Well, it creates that rook threat against the queen. So yeah, uh, activity-wise, you know, it's, it's helping white out a little bit, activating this rook. But overall, is the pawn better on d4 or e5? Not even just in the immediate, in the immediate. I mean, going forward as well. OK, I'm thinking long range is better because if pieces are exchanged, that's a 4 to 3 advantage on the pieces. Yeah, that's, that's exactly right. Rather than being stuck with an isolated pawn, now this pawn is actually where it you know, can have some support after a move like f4, which we wouldn't see in, in a position like this. But eventually, in an end game, you're actually going to find out that uh, we're going to find out by what was played that this pawn on e5 is actually quite a, quite a nice pawn. Uh, and the last thing, it, it does grab even more space. It's even more ambitious in taking space than the pawn on d4 was. So uh, we saw queen to c7 here. Now he is threatening to take this pawn. So we did see bishop f4 just defending it, bishop to e6. And now white says, OK, bishop f3, I want to keep the bishop pair. And more moves were played. I don't want to spend too much time on this, because it's really not too complicated of a position. Uh, both sides are just bringing their pieces to uh, the center. And white has kind of already solidified his advantage uh, in that he has this strong e5 pawn, and it's not going anywhere. This is where white's advantage is coming from, in addition to having the two bishops. So we saw queen e7, uh, bishop e3, bishop b3. And now white, again, has no reason to fear end games anymore, because he no longer has an isolated pawn. He has a strong e5 pawn. So we saw takes, bishop d3 hitting the bishop. Bishop comes back to uh, a4. Bishop g4. So again, white eventually is going to defend this pawn. He's just kicking around black's pieces first. Uh, rook to d8. Rook to d6 is actually, again, uh, indirectly defending this pawn through tactical means. if the rook were to take here. White actually has a nice tactic. Rook c takes on c6. And uh, white would be winning a piece thanks to this rook on d8. So OK, you can't capture this pawn yet. Rook to a8. And now finally f4. So again, now we see this pawn's no longer isolated. And white simply plays f4 uh, to defend it. So we saw knight d8, rook to c8, takes, takes. And we got closer to this end game here. Uh, and after takes, 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 we're finally in a, an eventual endgame. And so this is where white managed to uh, win this, thanks to some maneuvering, thanks to having this strong bishop against the not-so-strong knight, and having all this extra space in the center. And I'll go through it and show you how the game ended. But uh, the scope of this class was supposed to be mostly about the IQP. So any questions about how we got there? Because the kind of 
uh, the advantages that White had kind of shifted throughout the game. And, but it was all thanks to his activity. He used his activity to force Black to take on e5, which gave him the structural advantage and the advantage of having the bishops against uh, the bishop and the knight, which turned into a straight bishop versus knight endgame. So any questions about that in particular? No? All right. So yeah, let's see what happens. Uh, King f2. White simply brings his pieces into the endgame, following all the good principles, bringing the king up and in. And this pawn on e6 really ended up telling the tale here. Mm -mm. So after you know advancing his pawn up, he brings his king over. And we can see he wins this pawn on h5. And it's a story of the bishop being a long range piece and the knight being a short range piece. The bishop uh, pressures the queen side and helps aid in queening the pawn. The knight can only do one. So he has to give up on the queen side to come save on the on the king side here. And here is actually where Black resigned. Uh, he played king d5, hanging the knight for some reason before he resigned. But I mean, a move like this wouldn't really change the evaluation. White was simply winning uh, either way, simply pushing this pawn forward. Well, he has the wrong bishop, but he doesn't have the rook pawn. He has the knight pawn. So let's say something like this happens. Um, do have to be a little bit careful here. I think I might actually have to play bishop d8 here. You can't take, because I would queen. King c4, bishop here, king b3. And now I get to protect my pawn forever, and you can never really threaten it with your pawn. Which I'm not entirely certain. OK, well, I guess the big problem is once the king leaves, I can take this knight. Is okay. So either way, you know, eventually I put this bishop on a three, and uh, that will that will win the game, no matter where my king is. So yeah, that's how that end game ended up. Uh, once again, the main points to remember are these specific maneuvers and where the pieces go. That knight comes to e five in almost every game. Uh, this rook lift with rook to d three and over to the king's side is very very important. Uh, don't want to forget about the, those maneuvers for black with the knight on c6 coming to b4 and the idea for white of a3 to prevent that. And uh, hopefully, you know, this class gave you a little bit of an idea of the common attacking plans for white and how white can really kind of break through using this isolated queen pawn. Uh, with that in mind, uh, that's all for tonight. So thank you guys for joining me. Thank you guys for watching on YouTube. And uh, join me next week, next Wednesday.